heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. Ed Ludlow, he's off. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, well, as the markets drop, we'll talk all things IPO. Arm completes the biggest of the year. Instacart gears up to go public next week. We have so much more ahead. And we'll talk the state of fintech with the former CEO of SoFi as his company joins others in withdrawing applications for banking charters. Why? Plus, how will the UAW's unprecedented strikes impact automakers and the electric vehicle market? We'll discuss that and more. Plus, let's check on these markets because it is a down day and it is a volatile day. It is triple witching as we know, yet more volatility comes as the op options expire. The Nasdaq being off by 1.3%, dragging us lower. The Nasdaq 100 as well, feeling the pain. The Amazon's on the downside, so too is the NVIDIA's. And indeed, this news report circulating regarding TSMC that it's asked major suppliers to potentially delay shipments of high-end equipment. We look to try and see as to whether or not Bloomberg can confirm those sorts of reports, but the chip sector is down by 2.4% on the back of those sorts of news swirling. The bit, and indeed, Bitcoin risk assets in general on the downside were off by almost a percentage point in face of a dollar that is basically flat on the day. Moving on, individual movers, I want to get to you because we have seen, of course, the likes of Adobe underwhelming down by some 3.8%. Their numbers are actually coming in line, but not good enough. Too conservative was the outlook, even though they did see continued strength, particularly in the digital media business. We're looking at Apple on the downside, even though it had rallied in earlier hours as we saw some strong demand for the iPhone 15. And Arm still managing to tread water. Buck the trend, we're up more than 2% after its initial public offering. And let's stick with that theme, the comeback. It's here. And of course, this week was the biggest debut of the year. We, of course, were speaking with the CEO, Rene Haas, who was confident in the outlook for his business. We also have a very unique business model that gives us the ability to have a very, very good uh, vision in the future in terms of when people use our products. So relative to our confidence in the outlook, uh, we have a very, very high confidence that the growth rate that we have talked about will be sustained. So how idiosyncratic was that event? Or how can we read across the rest of the IPOs? Katie Roof is here in New York to discuss it all. You are the person who marries venture-backed businesses as well as M&A, as well as into the public markets and the banks. And I'm ultimately interested as to how your sources are saying this read across for Arm is for the likes of Instacart, for Clavio and other companies that want to hit this market running. Well, the IPO window is open. We've been talking about this for almost two years. You know, tech IPOs came to a halt in late 2021. And um, Arm has just been the first big one. And it went well. It went up 25%, which is, you know, where they often aim for these things to go. Uh, so, you know, we saw Instacart, they raised their price range, uh, probably partly because of this. Uh, it shows that there's public investor enthusiasm. Of course, Arm and Instacart are very different mm -hmm. companies. But bankers are still going to argue that this is, um, you know, a, a sign of tech enthusiasm broadly. Instacart raised their range for, um, from 26 to 28 to 28 to 30. At the top of that range, they would be $10 billion on a fully diluted basis. So still lower than where they were, but better than where they were hoping a few days ago. When we hear the reports of just how hands-on Massa was in this process and the idea that maybe he decided to undershoot in the overall price range that he could have got for the shares, leave money on the table to get that pop. Are we likely to see that replicated by the others that want to come to this market? How, how difficult a balancing act is this at the moment? So what happened was pretty unusual where they thought, you know, they could have priced, bankers thought that they could have priced the company at 52 a share, but Arm went with 51, partly because Masa just wanted to ensure, you know, big pop on the first day. But of course, that means that a little less money was raised for the company. Um, I would say usually companies are going to take the banker recommendation, where whatever it may be. Um, they do these pops to incentivize new investors for taking a risk on day one. Otherwise, why would you invest on day one? You'd wait until and see how it went. Um, but, you know, if you leave, if you do too much of a pop, then that's more that the company could have raised. So they try to time it, but of course it's all just a guess. They do these roadshows where they're talking to all these public investors, trying to figure out what they're going to buy, how much they're going to buy. And, um, it, you know, it, they do some math, but it's also a lot of guessing. 
And they've got an art of a guesser, you were just telling me before, that well, the CFO of Instacart knows these banking worlds well, having yeah. come from Goldman. Yeah, exactly. Nick Giovanni, the CFO of Instacart, he used to run Goldman's TMT, their investment banking uh, group for tech. So he was the one hmm. pricing all these tech IPOs in the past. So if there's anyone that knows how to optimize Instacart's success, it would be him. All eyes on him, all eyes on Clavio as well. For next week, we wait with bated breath. Katie Roof, we thank her for being here and safe trip back to LA. Meanwhile, well, let's dig into more broadly the market here and sentiment around technology names as we look for this IPO window to be back up and running with Laura Cooper, BlackRock senior macro strategist for iShares EMEA. Indeed, a, a former strategist over here at Bloomberg as well, Laura. And I, I'm interested as to, you're in the world of ETFs and what's so interesting about the arm listing, and I know you can't go into individual names, but it, it's likely not going to get into ETFs more broadly as it is an ADR, of course, a foreign company, but also very small floats. Overall, what sort of focus are you putting for your clients on these new companies to come to the market? Well, I think probably what's been most interesting is that we've seen a fairly muted IPO backdrop this year. It has been a little bit stronger than last year, but well below the levels that we saw back in 2021, for example. And I think this reflects a couple of factors. One is the fact that we are in this environment of heightened macro uncertainty. Investors have the uncertainty about where they, where rates are going. What's the growth dynamics going to be like? Will this actually be a profitable type of backdrop to enter into this market? And and second, I think there's this greater scrutiny around valuations because investors aren't necessarily chasing the next big growth stock, but it's really about looking at those margins, looking at the profitability and de demand dynamics to gauge, is this actually you know, something we want to invest in at this uncertain time? Uncertainty also geopolitical in when we think of the China exposure that an arm has. We also think of the AI hype that arm was satisfying at that moment. How much is artificial intelligence leaning into the valuation conundrum for many of your clients? I think certainly the AI hype has been a key driver around just the outperformance that we've seen in some of those U.S. tech stocks year to date. Yes, we have seen that come off a bit in recent weeks, but I think underlying this AI euphoria, there is still strong fundamentals. And it's one of the reasons why we do see artificial intelligence as a key secular mega force over the coming years. If we think about the profitability backdrop, this was clearly coming through in earnings. These are really those companies that can generate the type of earnings that investors are demanding. If we look at earnings estimates for the next 12 months, they're sitting at about that 15% mark. That's well above other sectors. And it's probably the only only sector that can actually meet those earnings expectations. So as those earnings potentially are justified in the coming quarters, we do think there's further scope for this tech rally to run, even as we start to see probably greater bouts of volatility around some of the negative headlines coming through. It doesn't really curb what we still see as a favorable long-term demand backdrop for these tech stocks. Go global, as of course you currently sit in that MEA role, and I'm looking at technology on the stock 600, the worst performing sector over the last three months overall. It's one of the worst performing on the day as well, Laura. How global is this view that technology is a sector to be in? I think it really depends on where we're going to see those beneficiaries from some of the long-term trends around, for example, reshoring in some of that semiconductor space. That is probably tilted a little bit more towards the U.S., but it really does reflect this market concentration. So that's leaning us probably more of a U.S. equity tilt over Europe at this juncture. But if we think about kind of broader in the tech space, it's not really known to be kind of the driver of those European mm -hmm. benchmarks. So I think overall, when we look at positioning in these tech stocks, it's probably tilted towards the U.S. That's probably where it's going to be the, the greatest demand resiliency. But for example, semiconductors is a very strong conviction call for us on the back of these medium term AI dynamics. And that we, we advocate for taking a global exposure because we do think there's pockets of opportunity and really not taking too much of a concentrated risk because some of those geopolitical fragmentations could arise and we don't want to have any particular exposure in that broader semiconductor space. Good on the day if you're looking at the socks. I, I'm interested in digging into some of the individual intricacies of what makes an AI company an AI company for you or indeed an AI opportunity. Which are the areas of application that you think are most fruitful? 
Well, I think there's really three ways of framing artificial intelligence from an investment perspective. The first would be would be around, okay, how does AI actually boost a company's earnings? How are we going to see this kind of change pricing models, revenue growth going forward? Particularly if we think about software providers, how are they actually going to deploy this to the broader landscape? So those companies that have actually been able to secure AI patents actually have seen an increase in their economic value. So they're already showcasing the impact of AI at the company level. Then we can think about, okay, how is AI going to impact operational efficiency? Are we going to see more streamlined businesses, more cost cuts? Or the other side of that, are we going to see this AI-generated boom drive this efficiency, this productivity gains that in turn will have some, some uh, benefits for some of these companies? And then third, I think, is probably the key question that we've been asked by clients more recently is really around how how is AI going to disrupt this on a sector basis? So which of those sectors are going to be the greatest beneficiaries? Some are quite obvious, for example, the software providers, semiconductors, as well if we think of the, the next step around cybersecurity, some yeah. of those proprietary data providers, but it's also thinking about healthcare, medical device innovation, in the legal field, where are we going to see AI disruptions? So it's about capturing those areas where we think it's not actually in the price yet, but they're probably going to be net beneficiaries as this AI trend unfolds. Still totally all-encompassing this AI conversation. Laura Cooper, great to have some time with you. Happy weekend, of course, at BlackRock. Meanwhile, coming up, well, we, before AI, we're all talking about the hype around crypto. We're going to go back to that hype, but talk about its application right now. And indeed, more broadly, where we're seeing fintech firms finding some concerns around actually wanting to become banks. We'll discuss with the figure co-founder and Mike Cagney. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now we wait with bated breath for potentially a statement coming from the White House. President Biden is going to be speaking about the strike action currently underway. We know it's actually kind of been a focus across many an industry, but members of the moment united at auto workers union they voted to strike as midnight after negotiations with what ford stellantis general motors they all fell through in fact gm ceo mary barra weighed in earlier today on bloomberg television take a listen i will say we're ready for this you know as we've dealt with uh covid and dealt with the semiconductor shortage as well as other supply chain challenges that have uh you know continued to persist from covid our team knows how to manage these situations they're staying agile and we're going to do what's right for the company we're going to make sure everyone stays safe we now can go to the white house we understand where president biden is addressing the nation parties over since this began over the last few weeks and over the last the past decade auto companies have uh seen record profits, including in the last few years because of the extraordinary skill and sacrifices of the UAW workers. But those record profits have not been shared fairly, in my view, with those workers, just as the Treasury Department has released a report pointing out that the most comprehensive report ever dealing with how unions are good for both union workers and non-union workers to, and the overall economy. Unions raise workers' wages, they said, incomes increase home ownership, increase retirement savings, increase access to critical benefits like sick leave and child care, and reduce inequality, all of which strengthen our economy for all workers. That's because unions, unions raise standards across the workplaces and entire industries, pushing up wages and strengthening benefits for everyone. That's why strong unions are critical to a growing economy and growing from the middle out, the bottom up, not the top down. That's especially true as we transition to a clean energy future, which we're in the process of doing. I believe that transition should be fair and a win-win, excuse me, for auto workers and auto companies. But I also believe the contract agreement must lead to a vibrant made in America future that promotes good, strong middle-class jobs that workers can raise a family on. Where the UAW remains at the heart of our economy, and where the big three companies continue to lead in innovation, excellence, quality, and leadership. Last night, after negotiations broke down, the UAW announced a targeted strike at a few big three auto plants. L let's be clear. No one wants a strike. Say it again. No one wants a strike. But I respect workers' right to use their options under the collective bargaining system. And I understand the workers' frustration. 
Over generations, auto workers sacrificed so much to keep the industry alive and strong, especially through the economic crisis and the pandemic. Workers deserve a fair share of the benefits they help create for an enterprise. I do appreciate that the parties have been working around the clock. I, and when I first called them at the very first day of the negotiations, I said, please stay at the table as long as you can to try to we'll work this out. And the, they've been around the clock, and the companies have made some significant offers. But I believe they should go further to ensure record corporate profits mean record contracts for the UAW. Let me say that again. Record corporate profits, which they have, should be shared by record contracts for the UAW. And just as we're building an economy of the future, we need labor agreements for the future. It's my hope that the parties can return to the negotiation table to forge a win-win agreement to continue our active engagement. I'm, dis I'm dispatching two members of my team to Detroit, Acting Labor Secretary Julie Hsu and White House Senior Advisor Gene Sperling, both of them been involved up to now, to offer their full support for the parties in reaching a contract. The bottom line is, that auto workers help create America's middle class. They deserve a contract that sustains them in the middle class. So thank you very much. That's all I'm going to say. Thank Mr. you. Mr. President, at what point would you get directly involved in negotiations? Should Hunter get a pardon, Mr. President? President Joe Biden there speaking on the UAW workers' strike, really reiterating that the workers have his support. Nobody wants a strike, he says, but oh, they are dispatching officials to offer support in the talks, and he wants the parties to return to the negotiating table and reach an agreement that he says would be a win-win. Let's first and foremost then go out to Washington. I think we have Kaylee Lyons standing by just to wrap up what is quite a difficult balancing act for the president because he wants to be pro-worker, pro-union, but also wants to be pro-EV transition. Yeah, that's exactly right, Caroline. And you certainly see that pro-union sentiment coming through in the remarks he just made, among many other things, him saying that they should go further because record corporate profits should be shared with a record contract for the United Auto Workers, saying that auto workers help build the middle class and deserve a contract that helps sustain them and the middle class. So clearly trying to uh, be on the side of the union here, even as he says that nobody does want to strike, because that strike also puts the other objective this administration has, or one of them at least, Caroline, which you alluded to, their desire for a clean energy economy, a transition to EVs, potentially at risk, depending on how long this strike goes. Remember, this is an administration that, through the Inflation Reduction Act, is offering massive subsidies on new electric vehicle sales. It also has a goal of having half of all vehicle sales, new vehicle sales by 2030 be electric. So these two goals are really in conflict here for this administration. It is a very difficult line to walk, but obviously what they ultimately want at the end of the day is this conflict resolved, which is why he is dispatching both Gene Sperling and Acting Labor Secretary Julie Sue to Detroit. Perfect wrap up. Thank you so much, Kaylee Lyons on the ground in Washington. Let's get you more context from the auto perspective for a moment as well. Blue Mose Gabrielle Coppola is with us. And Gabby, what's, what's so interesting is I immediately think of Tesla in all of this EV race and, of course, doesn't work with unionized workers. So how much is this going to be affecting basically the competition against Tesla of this moment if Ford, if Stellantis, if GM are affected by such strikes? Yeah, you know, I think it does make it even harder for the Detroit Three to compete with Tesla, um, at least in this moment, because, you know, they are plowing all those record profits and, you know, these record car, uh, car prices we've been paying. They've been putting that money into battery plants, into designing new electric vehicles. Um, so, but they have a long way to go to catch up with Tesla. Tesla has a 10 year head start. And let's not forget about, even though we don't see a lot of Chinese automakers mm -hmm. here in the US, they are, you know, knocking on the door around the world. So they are under a lot of pressure. Um, and, you know, I, it's a tension because I think the, what the problem is that the automakers for the last 10 years have kind of, you know, after 2008, they kind of, that was it. They, they got the monkey off their back. You know, they had mass, they really, you know, at the bargaining table in 2007 during the financial crisis, uh, the workers really sacrificed a lot. And I, I think the automakers kind of thought that was the end of the story and we're moving on now. And I think what Sean Fain, the UAW, is doing is showing them, hey, not so fast. You're, yeah. you're not, we're not going to agree to that. This, you know, now or never, man, that, that's what's happening. A new tactic at work. New leader too, Gabrielle Coppola. Absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to do a hard pivot now. We're going to return back to a conversation that is much more about 
tech, but actually largely maybe about regulation, about an administration and its desire to be adopting blockchain companies in particular. We just want to be talking to the blockchain firm Figure in the latest fintech company, actually to withdraw its application for a bank charter, a move made after years of waiting for answers from US financial regulators. Joining us now, I'm very pleased to welcome Mike Cagney. He is the former CEO of SoFi, co-founder of Figure, which uses blockchain to build financial products, such as loan origination, for example. We're also very pleased to welcome Shanali Basak to the show who's helped bring about this interview. And, and I think, first and foremost, a great article that you've helped pen in other media at the moment, Mike, just talking about the decision-making process of not becoming a bank. And it is, in large part, because of regulators. Well, it's, it's really around the state of regulation with blockchain. And the figure is a blockchain holding company. We have two blockchain-centric businesses, one in lending, one in markets. And we have over 200 state licenses. So you can see the appeal of having a national charter and not having to deal with the overhead of 200 state licenses. Also, the ability to have liabilities to fund the assets that you generate. But figure fundamentally is a markets business. And our lending business is more of a means to an end to build that marketplace out. And we felt without clear identification of what we could and couldn't do as a bank, it didn't make sense for us to move forward. There were other reasons as well, but that was that was the key one. I'm curious what you think this means about the future of financial technology. Your alma mater, SoFi, is really leaning into the idea of being a bigger and bigger bank. You have the regional banking system that may not be the ultimate form of capital for people like you moving forward. So what role do the upstarts start to play? So I think you're in a macro trend right now where the banks are contracting credit. And that would be exacerbated if the Basel III end game went through. That, that's unlikely to happen, at least you know, with the current regulatory or the legislative position. But you're in a situation irrespective where banks are pulling back. You're also in a situation where the asset liability ratio, where banks traditionally have, at least over the last several years, especially through COVID, have had massive amounts of excess liabilities and had to deploy that into assets. That's now flipped. Those banks are now liability constrained. They're having to sell those assets. And so I think systemically over the next five years, you're going to have a situation where non-bank lenders are going to be able to lean in and participate, access wholesale capital markets in a way that the banks are going to not be able to do. So they're going to fill that gap. It's also, we'd be remiss not to talk about this idea of it being a humongous week in the IPO market after such a massive drought. We've reported that your lending business you're considering an IPO for. How has this week changed your calculus about how you're thinking about speaking to investors? Sure. I, I think rather than talking to the IPO per se, I'd say that the, the lending business itself is a mature business, although it's still doubling every year. It's a profitable business, and it's really found an interesting opportunity in terms of lending technology. But what it is, again, is ultimately a marketplace business. And, and so when you think about what that vertical really looks like, it's not so much that it looks like an upstart or a SoFi with multi-product solution it actually looks a lot more like ICE. And, and that's ultimately the objective we're trying to go to, is to stand up private capital markets, to take advantage of this contraction that's happening in the banking system. And we think there's a great opportunity to do that. When you're thinking about being that marketplace, when you're thinking about intertwining TradFi with, with crypto and blockchain technology, how much institutional buy-in have you had of your product, of your offerings, of the way in which you want to be servicing? Sure. So we've done over $15 billion of transactions on blockchains with, uh, with banks, with institutions. And right now we're in the middle of a transaction with two very large private equity firms where we're issuing an asset-backed security, a AAA-rated asset-backed security native to blockchain. So it won't be on DTC. It'll actually be trading on the blockchain. And this is the beginning of what I think is going to be a systemic trend. I think by the middle of next year, we'll have tens of billions of dollars of, of native assets on chain and, and a true marketplace being developed out. Serial entrepreneur. <laughs> nice to have you out and talking about your latest one and indeed, well, the views towards maybe even a public listing in the next year or so. Mike, great to have you in the show. Thank you thank very you much, for Mike me. Cagney. Of course, we want to thank Shanali Basak as well for that conversation with Figure. Coming up, look, we're going to take the pulse of the world of climate tech investments right now. We're going to be joined by Tom Steyer. His galvanized climate solutions is raising huge amounts of money, funds to help with growth equity, with startups, with trying to find real world applications in the here and the now for climate tech into larger institutions, maybe into his own real estate. This is, of course, a discussion of cross asset investment in climate. From New York, from not from San Francisco today, Ed Ludlow taking a well earned break. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on what is a pretty volatile end to the week. In fact, we saw the S&P raise its weekly gains. We've seen the Nasdaq off by more than 1.3%. It is triple witching. What does that mean? We've got options expiring. We've got volatility, perhaps a ton more volume on the day than you'd expect on a Friday. We're seeing also a tug of war in the global geopolitical narrative and indeed the chip narrative. Now, after the successful IPO of Arm yesterday, we're still worried about perhaps TSMC reports out there that maybe they're asking some of their key suppliers just to dial back in terms of, well, offering their products. We're seeing the SOX, the semiconductor index, just down by some 2.4%. Bitcoin is off by 8 tenths percent amid this risk-off, risk-averse kind of a world, even though we did see Chinese data, remember, coming in better than had been anticipated at the start of trade that helped Europe not so much carrying on into the US. Let's move on and see what's happening on the individual movers, because as I mentioned, it was a very successful IPO in terms of the actual pop they got on the day yesterday and continuing into today's trade. They were up before trading more than 10%. Now we're up 2.3% for ARM. Looking at Apple, though, just coming off of its highs, it was rising after we saw some strong momentum into the sales of iPhone 15 and indeed the pre-ordering going on. We're now just off half a percent in line with the rest of the market. We're seeing Adobe being tugged down. Not good enough in terms of, well, they're pointing us forward. The conservative nature of their guidance not living up to expectations. But now let's pivot into the world of where private money is flowing at the moment. And is it tackling climate? Climate tech investments may be dipping actually this year, but Galvanized Climate Solutions still managed to close its first venture and growth equity fund over $1 billion. Let's bring in co-executive chair Tom Steyer for more. And how you're going to be deploying this capital. This is about startups, but with real world implications right here, right now, Tom. Absolutely, Caroline. I mean, we are... The need to solve the climate crisis is an immense tailwind for investment. So these companies can take advantage of an absolute necessity to solve a multitude of problems in terms of the ways we generate and use energy and build huge profitable companies as a result. So that in fact, solving a huge crisis is what capitalism is built for to serve the needs of society. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And how was appetite to want to come and invest behind this at the moment when we have seen valuations hit, we have seen a pull away from risk taking and particularly venture having a tough time of it? Well, I think that there are a lot of people in the world of professional investing who are just getting educated about the need to invest in climate response. Mm. And let me say this, Caroline, you know, in investing, when it's hard to get money and when valuations are coming down, that's a great time to have money. <laughs> and, you know, so it's you shouldn't feel bad for us. We think of that as this is a huge generational opportunity in general. And very specifically, this is a good time to have money and to be looking at investments and to be, you know, looking five to 10 years out. What's been so interesting is who you've been working with. You set up with Katie Hall, of course, deeply experienced way in which of managing money and cross asset perspective. But you've brought on some, well, some real experience here when it comes to this particular fund. How are you thinking of intertwining it with Galvanize more broadly? Because you do have a cross asset perspective. You're not only in venture capital and growth equity, but you're in real estate and you're in public equities. Absolutely. I mean, Galvanize the company is very specifically trying to take a multi-strategy approach and investing behind the need to solve climate in a very in a variety of investment areas. But specifically, this fund, Innovation and Expansion, we were lucky enough to get three partners to lead it. Viri Maxwell, Cliff Ryan, and Saloni Multani, who have long professional expertise, great track records, but also great experience and great knowledge about the climate space specifically. That's very unusual. And as somebody who started a number of investment activities and investment businesses, you really don't have anything unless you have great partners to lead it. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're talking about a specific investment effort, you have to start with great people, with experience, great track records, and knowledge of the place. I mean, you speak to your background, having led Farallon Capital Management, the hedge fund owner in San Francisco, but then you pivoted more mission-driven and indeed more, more political in the way in which you've navigated these waters. I'm interested, when you're thinking about galvanizing a youth voter in this moment, when we're looking at strikes within the UAW, when you're thinking of a president who has to navigate a desire for an auto industry that needs to pivot into a more responsible, climate-focused agenda, but at the same time, 
needs to share profits with its workers. How are you seeing the administration navigate the need for climate solutions too? Look, I think the Biden administration has done a fantastic job actually of trying to address our climate crisis in a sensible and economically sensitive way. And I think that one thing, Caroline, to remember, and the reason really that all of us, Katie, and the three people running this fund and everybody else in Galvanize is doing it is, we believe that we're gonna win in the marketplace. We believe this is a generational investment opportunity. And then in fact, the way that capitalism is gonna solve this crisis is by producing cheaper, better, faster, and cleaner solutions. And so when we think about what the Biden administration is doing hand in hand with the private sector, it's really to come up with new technologies, new solutions that are better for consumers so that it's not a question of asking people to sacrifice. It's a question of asking people to make sensible, smart decisions on their own behalf. That's how it's supposed to work. And that's what we're driving for. So let's go back to the capitalism and the money being deployed. You've already invested in 11 companies. Now, I know you're not managing this exact fund. You've just talked about the three experienced uh, people that you've got, Vary Maxwell, for example. But talk about some of the companies that you are choosing to back and why. Like when I'm looking at the routing company, when I'm looking at Regrow, Pulsora, what are they doing differently? Look, in every one of these companies, they're coming up with a need to solve an existing problem it with a new technology, with progressive new ideas in ways that people are going to spend money and they're going to drive revenue in a way that produces a large company that's going to grow really fast. That's what we're looking for. Early stage companies that can grow and scale. And if you're going to address a global problem, which is our climate crisis, that means by definition, you have to have a significant, important company that's going to be very valuable. So when we look at any one of those 11 companies, we're looking at a huge existing problem that is going to create huge companies. And the question is, can you figure out which ones are the great companies? Can you have them want, can you be the best partner for them? And can you help them scale and grow in such a way that you create real re returns for your investors and have measurable impact? That's what we're trying to do in this fund. That's what those three professionals have a history of doing and a specific long knowledge of this area in terms of how we're going to solve these different problems. And what about companies that are sizable already in the public sector that maybe you could invest in as you go for public equities too? Responding to basically, well, California, where you sit, maybe the EU taking desire for more regulation, but more transparency but maybe even broader, the US being slower than the rest of the EU. How do you see compliance affecting bigger companies going forward? Well, I think that this has always been, solving this problem has always been a question of a public-private partnership. Mm. And if you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed by the Biden administration last year, and which I think is having a huge impact, that's really a question of saying to people, we're going to give you a carrot to get this done faster. We're going to help you get it done. If you look at what the EU is doing, by and large, they're more going towards policies and rules that insist that you get it done. In each case, what we're really trying to do is accelerate the move to make it possible for people to invest more successfully, move faster and bigger, because the crisis is very much at hand. And when you, last thing I'd like to say, Caroline, is when you look at transparency, when we start to get real information, you know, the old saying is, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. We're seeing a demand for transparency about who is creating the real emissions, because once we have that, the managers can solve it. And really, companies can look and say, OK, we absolutely have to get that down. How can we do it? And that's why they're going to look to the kinds of companies we're creating. Tom, it's great to have some time with you, Tom Steyer, Galvanized Climate Solutions, co-executive chair on the latest funding, one billion. Now coming up, we're gonna go global, a little bit more even so, because look, let's talk about investments in Latin America. Moto is CEO Rubens Zalaneto. Zenalato and Bicycle Capital founder, managing partner, Shuniato is gonna be joining the program. This is Bloomberg Technology.
today's VC Spotlight moment, and we're going to be talking about Motu. It's a Brazilian motorcycle rental company, but actually more than that. It's the last mile delivery marketplace as well. It's just announced well, a $50 million Series C, co-led by QED investors and also Bicycle Capital, a new venture firm by former SoftBank executive Marcelo Clare and, of course, Shu Nieta. I'm pleased to say that joining us now is Shu Nieta, as well as Motu CEO Rubens, Rubens Zanelato, coming all the way from Brazil. And we thank you very much, gentlemen, both of you coming in from Miami, Brazil, to talk about the global global VC opportunity here and just paint the picture Rubens, about exactly what Motu is doing, how it's disrupting because it's not just a cleaner way of doing motorcycles. Yeah, actually the, the problem we're trying to solve, uh, there is high unemployment in Brazil and Latin and people don't have access to credit either. So uh, we are providing them a tool to work by renting motorcycles out to people uh, without um, any requirements of credit. Uh, and we started well, about three years ago, uh, just 50 bikes. In the first year, we deployed 1,000 motorcycles, and now we are deploying 1,000 every 10 days. Very across. excited to be here. You're looking across Brazil, across Mexico. I mean, that must be what drew your attention, the growth. But is it also the opportunity issue here in terms of it being more about delivery as well and engagement in well, the population? Yeah, there, there are two things that got us really excited. First is the metrics. The numbers always speak for themselves, and Motu has incredible numbers. They're growing over 300%. They're not just gross profit profitable. They're not just EBITDA profitable. They're net income profitable, which is very rare for a startup, and they're very capital efficient. So that caught our attention. But then the opportunity is huge. Brazil is dominated in the motorcycle industry by one company, Honda, that has 70% of the market, and it's ripe for someone to come in and offer something different. So you put those together and you have the chance to create something really big and meaningful. And then you just export that playbook to Mexico and do the same thing. Do you export it to elsewhere? You've just raised money. Is the idea about geographical reach? Is it more about building up the engineering, the talent? How do you deploy money? We are focusing on Brazil and Mexico now. All our growth from the assets comes from debt investors. So the way we were able to build a profitable company with very good economics is a very safe investment for that investors as well, the capital markets. Uh, and the money now is just to bring global talents for the company. Uh, we got huge companies like Nubank, Jimpez in Brazil that were able to bring top talents uh, and we, we want to go, do the same. It's interesting that you went for equity financing, but you have taken debt financing in the past. Is that something you yeah. analyze and look to? We, we are all about doing that. We raised more than $70 million in debt so far. 100% um, of our ca uh, capex is done with the capital markets with that. Shu, uh, this moment when you're looking at writing these sorts of checks and seeing this sort of growth, how competitive is it? And I mean, there's Tiger Globals on this round as well. There's plenty of other big name VCs. And I'm interested as to what valuations you're currently looking at and how you're talking amongst other venture partners. Yeah, the, the growth equity market globally has been a bit of a coma. Yeah. I'd say the, the patient's toes are twitching. <laughs> so opportunities are starting to come up, but it's only the ones with really exceptional numbers that are getting people's attention. And those are getting people's attention. We're co-leading this with QED, which is a firm of respect we've worked with before. Uh, the existing investors are all investing. So a company like Motu will never struggle to attract capital. The valuations are much more reasonable, though. So mm -hmm. nobody is overreaching when it comes to the number that they want. And I think that's healthy for everybody. It's healthy for the company. The other thing that's different is the time that these deals are taking to get done is slower. And that's also good for everybody. The companies get a chance to have investors really dig in, give them some feedback. Investors get much more comfortable with the companies. So I'd say we're entering a fairly healthy moment in the market, but only the best companies are able to attract capital right now. And you do your due diligence. You also look at the landscape of Latin America, the countries you know and how to invest in so well. How, how does that regulatory landscape look for a company such as Motu? How, does, how do you look at other players in the space? Yeah, the, the nice thing about tech in Latin America, in Brazil, is it's inclusive. Mm -hmm. The government is very supportive. It doesn't matter if it's the right or the left. The tech opportunity is about bringing more people into the economy. They're so deeply underserved, consumers and businesses both, so deeply underserved. So in the US, we tend to think of technology, AI is the latest boogeyman, as a threat to livelihoods. In Brazil, uh, technology is often a key that unlocks livelihoods. And that's a fundamental difference. And so the governments get very behind that kind of idea. It's what makes tech in emerging markets so attractive. It's inclusive, it's not disruptive. And that tailwind helps all kinds of companies, especially like Motu, that are so obviously 
bringing opportunity to people. Rubens, what you've done is you're saying you're able to provide these motorcycles, this way of making money to do deliveries to people who have either bad credit, no credit, but you must be using technology to understand what the risks are there. How have you managed to build out a credit company, an insurance company, a maintenance company out of basically a motorcycle company? Basically, we know that we need to be the best option for people every day. So we use technology in everything and to do a no touch experience. And in our team also have this frugality mentality to do more with less. So this is where, uh, how we were able to build uh, such a good economics net income company in these three years. I believe that very few companies got to really net profit company. Uh, and uh, we are all, all about serving people. And if we need to help them, we need to do a product uh, that's cheap and better than they have their own motorcycles. Many would think Brazil, political instability at times, economic instability at times. How do you push away from that narrative? How do you ensure that big, great, successful businesses can be built out in emerging markets in Latin America? We are uh, really a social business. Uh, we are pushing to help people uh, and be a way of Latin to make a better place to people, to people thrive and people have um, an opportunity to work. Uh, and doesn't matter who is the governing place, uh, we are there to be part of the good. Chu, you and Marcelo have really shone a light on Latin America. That's what Bicycle Ventures is all about, and the idea that people aren't seeing the opportunities. But are people seeing them more when you're having QED alongside you, when you're seeing repeat investors in the space? Is that starting to grow in consensus? Not really. QED <laughs> are unique. They've yeah. been in Latin America on the ground for quite a while, which is unusual for a global firm. We respect them for doing that. They have people in Sao Paulo, people in Mexico City. So they see what we see, which is markets that are ignored by global capital markets. They're side notes compared to the US and China, maybe even Europe, but the opportunity is much bigger than the capital available. So our fundamental view is there's just a dislocation in the market. People don't have the appetite or the patience to look past the headlines that you just called out, political instability, crime, inflation, and see the opportunities beneath. But if you look, there are great opportunities. So New Bank is the latest stunning example, probably the most valuable digital bank in the world, $40 billion market cap. There are many other companies coming that'll go public in the next couple of years that'll keep proving that Latin America can create a lot of equity value. And we like the situation where people are not paying as much attention because it's better for us. Mm -hmm. When you're doing your due diligence, it's great to have some time with you. Motu, of course, CEO Rubens Zanalato, who I say, flying out for this, and we appreciate it very much. Just so for this. Back to, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lovely to have you over here to fly back to Brazil. And Shunyata, as always, flying Thank in from you. Miami. We really appreciate it. Meanwhile, coming up, look, initial talks for the sale of Disney's ABC are heating up. We'll have all the details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. is what has been going viral. Disney holding initial talks, we understand, about selling its ABC network and TV stations to local broadcaster, Nexstar, that's according to sources. But then media mogul Byron Allen, who owns a string of TV outlets, Weather Channel as well, also has discussions with Disney, we understand, about acquisition of the network and his stations. It's all according to sources familiar with the matter. Let's get more familiar with it, because Disney is saying in a statement that the company still has made no decision with respect to the divestiture of ABC or any other property. Next time, meanwhile, declined to comment. Let's bring in Chris Palmieri, who's been really managing to cut through what feels like sometimes noise in the media industry, but the noise had always been for a little while that maybe this would be an asset for Disney to dispose of. Right. Well, if you remember, this started in July when Bob Iger said that, you know, maybe these traditional channels were no longer core to the business. And that set off a frenzy of people looking at the assets who might be interested. And I think that the, the fact that there hadn't been any progress really since then got people thinking, well, maybe we can start a fire here 
if you read the public comments that Nexstar executives have given, they said, hey, you know, we're interested, Disney, but, you know, what's the real terms here? Because there are a lot of complications with buying a, a network like ABC. For example, you know, how do you handle the sports that ESPN sometimes simulcasts on ABC or all the shows that presumably Disney would still own that air on the networks? So, uh, so there's a lot of questions, but I think we're starting to see people starting to raise their hand and say, yes, I, uh, I might be interested in this. And it puts a little pressure on uh, Bob Iger to do something. What about at this moment when he's also trying to navigate strikes, writer strikes, actor strikes? How is that sort of conversation progressing? Well, again, it's it's part of this all uh, uh, you know situation in media today, where it, the, everyone knows it's shifting towards streaming, uh, but the streaming business isn't profitable, and there are issues with labor. There's issues with uh, how do you produce the content, and uh, the traditional TV networks are losing viewers, and so that's that's a long-term drag on the business. So. Do you keep them because they're making money now and you can sort of run shows across the different platforms or do you sell and cash out? And that's, uh, that's what uh, Disney management and lots of other managements yeah. are wrestling in the media business with right now. We'll see how those conversations progress next week. Chris Palmieri, we thank you. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Don't forget about our podcast. This is Bloomberg Technology. See you soon.